Good morning, and welcome to Easter morning here at Hillside Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to be gathered together on Resurrection Sunday, and we, we're, we're happy to celebrate together. So wherever you are joining us today, uh, welcome home. This is truly where we belong, worshiping the Lord together. Uh, just a couple of announcements. We are still updating our church directory, so if we don't have your contact information, actually, don't assume we have your contact information. Please contact the church office with your current contact information to make sure we have it up to date. We would love to stay in touch during this time of separation. And as always, if there's anything we at the church can do to be of service to you, or if you just want to chat, please give us a call. You can reach us by phone, email, Facebook. There's really no wrong way to get a hold of us. But as we gather for worship this morning, we remember that the God who created the entire universe, the God who is making all things new through the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, is here with us when we gather. So as you hear the music of the prelude, I pray that it would draw you into the presence of God, that we would truly worship in spirit and in truth. ourselves that we are not drawn here by accident, but it is the Lord himself who calls us to worship. So hear and join in as we call one another to worship the Lord. Join together with the heavenly chorus. Alleluia! Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for drawing us here this morning. Lord, the fact that we are able to worship you is evidence that your Son is alive and at work in this world, at work in our hearts. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would unite us. Although we are scattered, that we would come together to praise you for who you are and for all that you do. We thank you for your presence here among us. We ask that you would move in our hearts, fill us with peace and the joy of Easter morning, that we would come together and worship you with all that we have and all that we are, for you alone are worthy. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please take a moment to silently confess your sins now before we join together in prayer. Lord, hear us as we pray. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. But we confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. First scripture lesson from today is taken from Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 3 to 8. So hear now the word of the Lord. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, ancient 
of days through the Spirit, who clothes faith with certainty, honor and blessing, glory and praise to the King, crowned with power and authority. And we are raised with Him, death is dead, love has won, Christ is conquered. Our second scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. So here, once again, the word of the Lord. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Lord, if I say anything that is not of your will, may it fall to the ground and be quickly forgotten. But Lord, when you speak your word to your people, may you write it in our hearts and change our lives forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So at the beginning of this passage, we know Jesus had been killed, he'd been buried, his disciples were crushed. All of their hopes had been dashed. They thought he was going, he was here to change the world, he was going to conquer Jerusalem, rise to power like David before him, uh, throw out, Israel was going to become a superpower, and it was all for nothing. Everything they'd witnessed, uh, despite how many times Jesus had warned them, going to rise again, three days later, did not occur to them that they were so crushed and hurt that what had happened on Good Friday. So they were going to the tomb. We're told it's early on the Sabbath as the first day of the week was dawning. So it's, they got up while it was still dark out, which, if you're like me, getting up before light is just, you have the ache in the pit of your stomach, and you're going to do a task that you really don't want to do. I can imagine... They're just dragging their feet, better get this over with, and and they're approaching the tomb. And I think in this moment, all of us are invited to approach the tomb. Uh, Really, in some ways, this is a question that we all have to answer. We all are going to face death. We all have to come to terms with our own mortality. How do we answer the question, what is after this life? I think how we answer that question changes our entire outlook on life and changes the way we live. 
in, in some ways, our, our society has become experts in avoiding the question. Uh, we live in a very sanitized culture, very unlike cultures around the world, very unlike any culture that has ever gone before us, Funeral homes are a relatively modern invention where we take dead people and we sort of put them away and we make them look pretty and we, uh, we, we, we you know, you come, you can view them but from a distance and even then we don't bring our kids to funeral homes like we used to. In most cultures around the world, when somebody died, they were laid out in the living room. Well, most houses were only a single room, but so they were laid out on the kitchen table maybe. That was, and then family would come and pay their respects and, uh, but you, you had to bury them pretty quickly. Most cultures had a kind of a 48-hour turnaround because there was no refrigeration. There was a, the person started to decay in front of you. Your loved one decayed in front of you. It, it's kind of a horrifying thought to think about. What, what, <laughs> in, in, in most cultures, but most cultures were eminently more acquainted with death. I don't know if there has ever been a culture less acquainted with death than ours. And I think since the rise of the coronavirus, since uh, people have been worried about getting sick, worried about their loved ones getting sick, we're sort of facing those questions. What does it mean to face death on a regular basis? Our culture is so secure, so sanitized, that there's, really, there's very little risk in going out on a day-to-day -day basis, but suddenly people are mindful that just a trip to the grocery store could become fatal. Most cultures throughout most of time, everyday activities, you could get sick and there was no hospitals, there was no help. If you got sick, you were largely on your own. In fact, in a lot of cultures, your family would distance, would distance themselves from you. If, they, if you caught something very contagious, they didn't want to be around you. We, we live in a day and age where we're being forced to ask, what does it mean to face death? What does it mean to face the tomb? What does it mean to consider our own passing? So I invite you to join with the women on that ancient Easter morning. Join them on their journey to the tomb as we understand what it means to find life in the midst of despair. So just imagine with me, if you will. There's, and and I, I'm just going to take this for granted. I don't have time to get into it today, but I take for granted that Jesus rising from the grave was a physical historical event that actually happened. There is a ton of evidence. Even completely agnostic uh, historians say, well, they certainly believe that the first disciples believed he rose from the grave. There's, there's unquestionable evidence that they believed it with their whole heart and were willing to die for it. So I just take that for granted that this is not a fairy tale. This is a true story that happened in history. So you're, imagine yourself. You, you're feeling exhausted. You're, you have to do this unpleasant task. You're dragging your feet. You're on your way to the tomb. You know, you know you're going to find a dead body there because like at every point in human history, dead people stay dead. It, it's just an immutable fact of life, right? There was no question in their minds. Gee, do you think he's still going to be in the tomb? Uh, we're, we're so used to the good news of Easter that, but take it for granted even the best and brightest of us, even the, our great hope for the future, he has died and the despair is overwhelming you. But suddenly, they're shocked, they're surprised, there's an angel, there, there's an earthquake, there's, the, the tomb is empty, and he, and he says, he's risen. There's, there's wonder and bewilderment. It, and and, and you're, can it be true? Come, come see where he laid. See the folded grave clothes. See that he's not here. And you're still trying to process this. I can't even imagine the shock that, would, that this would be. And, 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 and could, could it be true? Could it possibly be true? Well, we better run and go tell the disciples. At the very least, we have this news report that maybe we, we've been told he's alive. And so as they're going to, to see him, suddenly they actually see him in person. Not only do you think it's true, but it is confirmed to be true. There he is. <laughs> and he says, greetings. Uh, and you're sitting there. You have just gone in the span of maybe 10 minutes from utter and complete despair to overwhelming joy. <laughs> well, that, that, that just gives you a glimpse of the power of Easter. That is just a glimpse of a tiny taste of what the resurrection means, to be filled with such joy. But, but, I, I, but as we explore that joy, I want to ask, what does it mean 
that the tomb is empty. You come and you find the tomb empty, you find Jesus alive, what does that mean for our life 2,000 years later? What does it mean for us today? Well, first of all, if the tomb can be empty, again, literally, physically, historically empty, Jesus physically rose from the dead, if that actually literally happened, well, for me, that, that means we have to call into question everything we thought we know to be true. If you doubt the resurrection, then it's a question that at least you have to ask. What if it's true? It's changed billions of people's lives, this truth. If it's true, it means everything. If it's not true, it means Christianity is a complete lie and we're all wasting our time. But what if it's true? Don't you have to at least explore the possibility? Don't you have to at least look at the eyewitness testimony? Don't you have to at least investigate for yourself to know if it's true? Because if it is true, then everything you know might not be true. We have to question and rethink everything we know about life. Because if it is true, if Jesus did rise from the dead... If he did stand and greet those women that Easter morning, then it means, quite possibly, that Jesus is who he said he was. All of the declarations he made about how we're supposed to live our life, all of the things he said about loving your neighbor, it's not just good advice. It means that he is the Lord of creation. It means that everything he said was God's word. And if if, if he was actually raised from the dead after three days then it means that his word is law, that he is the king, that he is my Lord and Savior. It means that my sins are actually forgiven. It means that when he died on the cross, he actually accomplished our justification. It wasn't just a grand gesture of sacrificial love. It wasn't just the demonstration of the kind of love that good people ought to live. No, it means that my sins are actually forgiven, that he actually accomplished what he set out to, that he actually achieved victory over the forces of death itself. It assures me that my justification, that if, because his word is God's word from the beginning of time, to be trusted beyond doubt, if his word is God's word, then when he says When we proclaim every Sunday morning that the good news of the gospel means your sins are forgiven, it means you can take it to the bank because your sins are forgiven. And your standing before God has been made right. One of my great uh, favorite Christmas hymns uh, has the line, Now we need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. If Jesus can rise from the grave, It means there's hope for me. It means that this life is not all there is. It completely changes the way I live. When I go to the grocery store, I don't fear death the way that non-Christians might fear death because I know that my place before God, my place for eternity is secured, that Jesus accomplished it, gift-wrapped it, and placed it into my life by his death and resurrection not have to fear death is an incredible gift. Because if we don't have to fear death, what else is there? And of course, I don't want to die. I have a beautiful wife. I have a child. I love my family. I love living. I love everything about my life is wonderful. I get to teach about God's word every day. It's, you know, when you do what you're called to do, when you do what you love, you don't want to miss a single minute of it. But I know that my life is so much more than just my physical reality here on earth. It's not just these 80-some years that I'm given. My life stretches into eternity. The work that I do will be brought to fruition. Every promise that Jesus made about his coming kingdom and his plan to renew and remake the world, it means that it's all true. And it means, therefore, that everything sad is going to become untrue. So for all the brokenness and evil and frustrations and heartache of this virus, I know that this suffering is fleeting. And so I'm able to endure it with hope and joy. And knowing that my place is secured, knowing that whatever I suffer in this life is nothing compared to the glory that we will enjoy in God's kingdom 
with all the believers from every time and place, with the family of faith. And we will celebrate and feast and, 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 and walk with our Lord again. Uh, the amazing promise of the resurrection, the meaning of the empty tomb is life-changing. It's life-giving. Because Jesus died and rose from the grave, it means the power of death is broken. As the passage from Romans reminds us, when we are baptized, we're baptized into his death. That, that's the meaning of baptism. When you, it used to be an actual ceremony where you went under the water. And still, to this day, even if we sprinkle the water, the, sim, the, the symbolism is that you go under the water. Well, you all know what happens if you go under the water. Have you ever gone swimming? If you go under the water and you don't come up again, you're dead. <laughs> Every time you go swimming, if you go under the water, uh, we humans have to breathe in order to, <laughs> in order to survive. So you go under the water, you're, you have, you, your old life is washed away. The symbolism is you are cleaned, but the old life is dead. You, you died under that water. You, you went into the tomb with Jesus. Your, all of your old life, everything broken and flawed and sinful about you, Jesus took on the cross and he took with him into the tomb. You died with him in baptism. And in baptism, as you come out of the water, you rise to new life. Your old sinful life was dead. He took it into the tomb with, you, with him. And then you rose to new life. The empty tomb means that my sins stay in the tomb and my new life is with Jesus in the resurrection. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. It means that death has lost its sting. It means that when we share in his death, we take up our cross. We, we sacrifice ourselves for the good of his kingdom. We follow him in discipleship. By all means, we follow his path of life. We follow him into the grave, sacrificing anything we need to. But we do so knowing that our hope is so much greater, knowing that our joy is more profound than anything we could possibly lose. And so we celebrate with joy on Easter morning. Easter is our high holy day because we can't contain the joy that changes our life. It's not an empty promise. These aren't just words of advice. If, if, if no one would come, no one would tune to listen to you know, Sean's daily advice for the day. I'm not that smart. I'm not that wise. But the words of God are eternal. They're everlasting and they're life-giving. So I think the only logical question for us to ask is how do we respond to such good news? How do we respond to an empty tomb? Knowing what it means. I think one of the best ways to respond is the message that was told to the women that morning over and over again. Do not be afraid. The angel said it, Jesus said it multiple times, do not be afraid. Once the fear of death has been removed, what is left to fear? Christians can boldly serve and love one another. Again, with, with all worldly wisdom, with all proper precautions, not wanting to die, not taking our life as cheap when Christ has paid such a price for it, but knowing that death is but a shadow, knowing that although death is an enemy, its back has been broken by the power of Jesus Christ. So, so if one, fear is gone from your life and been replaced with joy. Two, we respond to the cross by going and telling others about what happened. We tell the story. We read the story to our children. We tell the good news as, as, in any ways we can. The, the women were told multiple times, go and tell the others. When you have new life, when you have been given new hope, new purpose, you can't help but tell others about it. And, and this is one of those things that, you know, if you, have, if you try a new topping on your pizza and you love it, and you absolutely love it, you're going to tell at least five people about it because, oh my gosh, I tried this new thing and it was amazing. Have you ever tried pizza with ranch sauce instead of pizza sauce? Oh my gosh, mind-blowing. Which, by the way, 
I, I've, been, I've been doing no carbs throughout all of Lent, and I'm really looking forward to some pizza <laughs> this week. <laughs> it's glorious. But, but as glorious as ranch dressing is, as glorious as a new restaurant or a new favorite food is, and as much as you want to tell others about it, how much greater the news that I have been relieved of fear. I have been set free from the guilt that plagues me. I have been emancipated from all that is broken and wrong in my life, and I have been given hope and a resurrection. I want to tell everyone about this. If you don't have this good news in your life, then you are missing out on the most amazing feast. You are missing the most amazing good news uh, the, the fear of missing out on this has to be so profound that everyone in our society, everyone in the world needs to know the good news that Jesus raised, was raised from the dead and what it means for their life. It doesn't mean you have to be a street evangelist. It doesn't mean you have to go door to door handing out Bible tracts. It simply means that you have to share the good news of what God has done in your life. What does it mean for you? What does it mean for you that you have hope that this world is not all that there is, that your place in God's kingdom is secure? What does that mean? If you're like me, it means so much. And it means the desire to go and tell the others what it, mean, what it could mean for them. And I think it is in carrying out that mission that we truly find uh, Jesus. It is in carrying out, it, it is in walking with the other disciples who are also being sent to carry it out. That's when we encounter the Lord on the road. It, it, it is when we live out our faith in community, when we are carrying out his ministry to the world. That's when we find Jesus alive. That's when we find Jesus present among us most. And so we long to come back together physically as a community to serve and love our neighbors. Living as disciples makes Jesus alive in a real and powerful way. And of course, the empty tomb means we are filled with such joy that transcends any situation, that sets us free from the pain of this world. And we respond, we give thanks in all things to the love that we have received in Jesus Christ, giving thanks for the empty tomb, giving thanks for the love that he has shown us as we Give thanks for the good news of the gospel that is available to all of us this morning. Amen.
please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the joy of the resurrection this morning. We thank you for the hope that it brings to our lives. We thank you for the, the light that you give to the world in your work beginning a new creation. Lord, in all this, we give you thanks and praise. But Lord, we come before you in the midst of a broken world, a world that is hurting with fear and doubt and struggling against sickness and death. Lord, we pray that you would be with all people who are suffering. We pray that you would be with those who are stricken with this virus, for those who are stricken with any illness, for those who are simply suffering economic hardship, make, trying to make ends meet and provide for their family. Lord, there are so many people so preoccupied with their pain and hurt that they find it difficult to draw their attention to you. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work, that you would strengthen and empower your church, that we would be the healing hands of Christ wherever we go, that we would bear the good news in the light of your word. Lord, in all things, grant us courage to face this world with joy in the midst of suffering, with hope in the midst of fear, and that in all things, your word might conquer and your kingdom come. Lord, I ask that you would be with our local communities, our friends and families and neighbors. There are many people we know of who are in need of your love and care, and we lift them up to you now. Lord, we ask that you would be with those we know of who are hurting and suffering. We know of so many stories of people who are battling illness, of people who are just exhausted uh, with being taxed at work, people who are scared about what next month will bring. Lord, for all of them, we lift them up to you now, and we ask that your will might be done. And finally, I pray for all those in the sound of my voice. I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on them, strengthen them, encourage them, fill them with joy and light in a powerful and profound way that they would be the light wherever they go. And in all things, Lord, we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. But lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time in the service when we have the opportunity to respond to all the grace and love that God has shown us. Now is the time when we would normally collect our offerings, so I would invite you to continue to give to the church to support the ministry and work of Jesus Christ here in Greenville, whether you give by mailing in a check through online banking, through uh, online giving, through our website, there's no wrong way to support and love, uh, the, love the work of God and respond to his grace in your life. But really, this time is about offering our hearts, offering our lives in service to him and thanksgiving for all that he has done and all that he is. So now we offer our hearts to God as we sing together the doxology. Father, I thank you so much for all the gifts that you have given us. Lord, whatever offering we bring in whatever form we bring it, we pray that you would bless it, multiply it, use it for the sake of your kingdom work here on earth, that in all things, your name might be glorified, your will might be done. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. 
sin through sacrifice to conquer every sting of death. Sing, sing hallelujah. For joy awakes as dawn arrives when Christ's disciples lift their eyes. Alive he stands, their friend and king. Christ, Christ, he is risen. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Oh, sing hallelujah. Join the chorus, sing with the redeemed. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Where doubt and darkness once had been, they saw him and their hearts believed. But blessed are those who have not seen. Yet sing hallelujah. stay indoors, I pray that you would remember the good news of the gospel, that you would go tell of his goodness, and that in all things the Lord might dwell richly in your heart, and you would live in the hope of the resurrection. And as you go, receive this blessing. May the hands of Christ tend your every wound. May the Holy Spirit breathe in your ears just the things you need to hear. And may God the Father receive you into his everlasting arms at the last. Amen. Amen.